This is Jordan Poyer, safety for the Buffalo Bills, and you are now listening to Cover One Buffalo Podcast. Let's go. Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your host, Greg Thompson, and tonight I am joined by special guests to be able to talk about the big news that continues to keep happening. And uh, we'll, we'll get into the fun of that. If you guys haven't checked out everything we have going on over at CoverOne.net, please do. We have a lot of fun and exciting stuff going on, breaking down every single move that's taking place. We're going to keep you updated throughout of all free, j- free agency. We're going to be able to go through every draft prospect, breaking down everything that's out there. You have work coming in from Eric directly. you got all kinds of stuff from Russell, from Christian, from Zach, from from Brad Kelly, from everybody doing all the hard work to get you ready for everything to take place this offseason. Check us out at CoverOne.net. Give us a rating. Give us a review. Uh, sign up for the premium membership. The Slack channel has been just off the charts uh, here. I know obviously all of us are kind of hunkered down. Uh, we were talking about Kinda. you know the impacts of everything that's going on here. It's great to be able to keep your mind occupied and have something else to take your mind off the realities of the world. So, you know, as we've talked about on the, the previous shows here, you guys are coming here to get away from that and to let sports be a distraction. So we're not going to spend a lot of time there, but you know, be courteous to each other, be considerate, you know, be careful, listen to the the guidance that's coming out here, and everybody stay safe. Uh, so for tonight, our special guest first uh, from a name that many of you will recognize, our man from WGR, Nate Geary. Nate, how are we doing? Very good. Uh, I am hunkered down, as you'd say. <laughs> um, I just had a delicious Irish dinner, uh, had some corned beef, had some cabbage, no potatoes, because you know I'm on that keto. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, it's St. Patrick's Day. I kind of forgot. You know, it's just been such a weird, weird week. But uh <laughs> What a great couple of days! I really, I'm, I'm pretty excited to hash out some some Steph Diggs talk here. Yeah, it, it's going to be really exciting. A uh, quick side note: it's a bonus that the people in Boston not only have to suffer through Tom Brady leaving, but it's St. <laughs> Patrick's Day and they can't even go to the bar. That's right. So it, it's a real added shouting for it to uh, enjoy there and to be able to talk <laughs> about the major addition that's coming aboard here to the Buffalo Bills. We thought that our best bet would be able to get a, uh, an expert who has watched him throughout his career and, and knows the Vikings inside and out. Uh, Arif Hassan, uh, how we doing, my man? I'm good, man. Hunkered down as well. Uh, have always been a fan of cooking, so trying out a bunch of different recipes. Got had a, a four hour bolognese uh, earlier today. That was pretty good. Had a kimchi jjigae, which is a kimchi stew, a couple of days ago. That was pretty great. So living my best life within the circumstances. Good. God bless you. That's fantastic. Cabbage in a different way, my friend. Cabbage <laughs> yeah, in a different way. Yeah, nice. yeah you got <laughs> it. For anybody who uh, isn't familiar with, with Arif's fantastic work, uh, check him out at The Athletic Minnesota, covering everything that's going on there. Um, let's dive right into it, guys, and we'll get to some of the other moves and things that are happening here. But the big move of the day was an enormous swing last night. It happened late at night. I, I tried to go live while I was still coherent uh, and did a show on the Bills trading for Stefan Diggs. You're talking about a 26-year-old number one wide receiver under contract. They gave up, you know, they paid full premium dollar for for the the price. And I I got into that with some people today that I feel pretty strongly they did that because of the contract. If there's additional demands on top of that, you know, we'll see where that takes us. But I'm going to assume at a face value right now that they're taking him on with the four remaining years and the, you know, roughly the Vikings paid the first twenty six million of the deal. The Bills take on the remaining four years and forty six million, but they gave up a lot, and they gave up a first round pick. They gave up next year's fourth. They gave up a fifth and a sixth. Um, all those are picks that Bean has moved around to be able to do. But let's start out on the, on the Vikings side of this. You know, how are Vikings fans and and people who are connected with the team taking this? Is this the culmination of? an inevitable destination is there sticker shock Uh, how are people feeling about is this making the best of a rough situation or or how are people kind of interpreting this move to this point Uh, i i think vikings fans are split i think people who follow the team are fairly split you know some people they they see him tweet all the time and it's usually uh and, and it was pretty easy to dismiss i think early on because you know once he got on the field you know he worked as hard as he could so it was very easy to say you know he's kind of committed to the team but um, a lot of people got kind of sick of it, um, even if it was kind of trolling or if they had convinced themselves it was just him playing around. Uh, it, it got kind of annoying to some people. So, um, you know, they wanted him on the team, but, you know, finding a way to, to, to ship him off and get 
uh, some return. Uh, you know, a lot of people really like that. They think that, um, you know, players should be seen and not heard. I don't know if I'm quite in that category or anything like that, but they got kind of annoyed, um, with, uh, with, they would say his antics. I wouldn't even go that far, um, but they got kind of annoyed. And so this was kind of a culmination of that. The other, there's another portion of people that are, are pretty emotionally attached to, to Stefan Diggs as much as you can be to, to an athlete, you know, the face of the Minneapolis miracle, a really remarkable player in a lot of respects. Uh, I think the engine of the offense this year for the Vikings, um, especially with Adam feeling hurt for a lot. Um, it, it was pretty easy for a lot of people to get attached to a person who has a ton of personality, um, in, in real life when interacting with real people is like a really kind person, uh, does a lot for charity. Um, I, I would argue that despite kind of all of this stuff that, that, you know, has come out or is, or might be coming out about kind of locker room drama and stuff like that. Um, it'd be difficult not to say that he's a high character person. I mean, he, he's done a lot for his family. He's done a lot for other people's family. And so people really connected with kind of his, his community outreach efforts. And so there's, there's people on the other side of that, that recognize the kind of talented player he is. And, you know, there's people who can kind of, you know, straddle both. They say, Hey, I understand that this is a fair value for a trade. I think even maybe the Vikings got, got more out of the trade than you would have expected. Um, and I'm still sad. Right. You know, there's people that are like that, which I think totally makes sense because they haven't, you know, they haven't formed an emotional connection with like Denzel Mims or, or Justin Jefferson, whoever it's going to be, that's going to be playing in that role. So right now, a lot of people would really like Diggs. And I think a lot of people in, in Vikings land consider Diggs to be a relatively not underrated receiver. But, you know, when people talk about, you know, the top whatever receivers, they, they don't tend to talk that much about Stefan Diggs, despite the fact that he's got this kind of array of talents that are, that are really useful. So um, really split a lot of kind of, I think, emotions about the trade. Um, not quite the same thing as, you know, the Vikings trading Randy Moss or anything like that. It's not quite that, but uh, it, it is, it's, it, it's been a lot and it's been kind of a, a pretty big story. So, so Nate, when you're hearing the way he describes that and talking about what's been, I think, I'm going to say 90, 10, 95, 5 excitement. I've, I've had mm-hmm. a few people in my mentions asking about, is this guy a diva? Is he a culture fit? Did we pay too much? But I, I'm going to say in my mentions, it's been 95 to 5 in positive and really excited about the move. What, you know, you obviously have the pulse on, you know, the the Buffalo fan base as, as much as anybody with, with your role hosting the show and how interactive you are with the fan base. What has your interpretation been from what you've heard from fans? And then how do you feel about your initial reactions of getting a player like this compared to what we gave up to do it? Yeah. I, I, I mean, first and foremost, I, I, I would like to start on on sort of my side of this. Um, obviously, I'm really, really, really excited about <clears throat> just the idea of a player like Diggs, because I think it's been the type of it's, it's been the role that they have long needed um, and have long failed to get, even though they, it's not for lack of trying. I mean, we know Doug Whaley traded up. um, And I think that for Sammy Watkins, of course, and, and I think that the scar tissue of the Sammy Watkins trade um, and, and part of the, the trade that happened earlier in the day where, um, Deandre Hopkins got traded for an old bag of, of, <laughs> of bread, of sliced bread, uh, that, that was dipped in milk all day long, warm milk, and then given to the Houston Texans in exchange. So I, I, I think that unfortunately the expectation of whatever happened with the bills and that trade was always going to look like an overpayment. Um, based on what we saw happen on the market. And I think that the Bills paid fair market value for a player with incredible uh, talent at at, at an ideal age in the prime of his career, 26 years old, uh, fits the archetype of the players that this organization wants to bring in, guys that um, you know aren't going to count against you uh, in a cap situation. He's the second highest paid player per year um, on the roster as it sits right now. And I think you feel really good about that. And, and I think as long as you can equate and understand that, hey, the Bills spent their 22nd pick on Stephon Diggs, and, and as long as you can get yourself there, and of course they they, they traded a, uh, a couple additional picks as well, a fifth and sixth, a two, a two fifths and six or something like that, right? Future fifth fourth, fourth. Of, and then fifth and sixth this year, yeah, the two that we change. got for Wyatt Teller. <laughs> Change and and you know I don't, I don't want to just dismiss that as change because we know that Brandon Bean has been pretty 
I mean, pretty good at sort of uncovering these third, fourth, fifth rounders. So I don't want to just dis- dismiss those as useless assets, but um, they are assets that you can turn into a bona fide number one receiver. I, I was on WGR earlier with Nightcap with Joe DiBiase, and I said that this is as close to me as the Terrell Owens move, but in a far more appropriate setting um, more sustainable. where you yeah a more sustainable setting where you you know that you're at, you have a team in a window um that needs to add a blue chip talent and that's i kind of keep going back to this idea of blue chip talent and blue chip players and and uh, sort of obsessing about it a little bit but i think it just goes to show you that this time last year i basically had the argument that they have won and that's maybe it's tredavious white um, I think that we ended the year last year uh, thinking that Tremaine Edmonds is very close to being a blue chip player, um, that Matt Milano is a very close uh, blue chip type player. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, Devin Singletary, Dawson Knox, I mean, these guys aren't blue chip players, but those are have the potential to get to that level after their second season this year with steps up. So you add Stefan Diggs and you're adding a player that can absolutely change the course of this offense. And you talk about adding the best route runner in football with the best second best or third best, whatever you want to dub Cole Beasley as Um, I'm comfortable with either. Um, You have players that can give a quarterback with less than ideal accuracy, the additional margin for error that he needs to be a potential playoff winning and, you know, Super Bowl winning quarterback. That's how you get a average to below average accuracy guy, a Trent Dilfer, right? These guys that haven't been good quarterbacks, you know, that with great defense, you can win with the subpar quarterback play. Um, you know, why can't Allen get to the level of play of a uh, Trent Dilfer? I mean, obviously that they don't have the 2000 Ravens defense, but you know what I mean? Um, the, the Super Bowl winning quarterbacks don't have to carry the team on their backs. So if you're Josh Allen, how do you get incrementally better this year? It helps that you have Stephon Diggs. <laughs> no, and I think that's perfect in, in the way that you talked about it. I know um, I read the roundtable that you did a reef and I thought that you spoke to it well in that, you know, the additional picks matter. And I do think that it's kind of balanced in the contract that's in place. I think the reason that Bean was comfortable playing, paying the full premium is because you're getting him at, you know, the bills are taking on 11 to 12 million a year versus, you know, obviously on the open market, he'd be 15, 18, 20 million a year for the deals that you're seeing going out there. I don't, I don't think he's a lesser player than Amari Cooper uh, in the deal that he just got there. So, I mean, certainly debatable, at least in the, in the, the range that they're in. So those things matter. The good part is, those picks are ones that being already added as extra pieces. You know, he had an extra fifth and a sixth for moving Wyatt Teller to uh, over to Cleveland. He has an extra 2021 20, fifth for Zay Jones. So, you know, the seventh they got back kind of nets out that difference between the fourth and the fifth. It, you know, it's those kind of moves that are there. We just made two other moves that we'll talk to in a bit here. He now has extra pieces on the defensive line, extra pieces in some different areas that I'm guessing we're going to see a couple more of those trades. And all of a sudden, at cut down day, the way he has the past two years in a row, he's going to move a couple of those pieces to accumulate a couple more extra picks to be able to give himself this ammo because uh, Brandon Bean has shown a propensity to take that additional valuable depth that other teams would be happy to have and you can now turn that into an extra fourth an extra fifth an extra sixth and use that for ammo here so i think if he didn't have that history of doing that i'd be a little bit more concerned that hey did we give up a little bit too much but when you consider that you know in the chat we were kind of talking about it here he basically traded a first wyatt teller and zay jones for Stefan Diggs versus the the draft picks that were there. So <laughs> it kind of helps, you know, lessen the the cost from that standpoint. Um, let's focus a little bit on the football side of things. And for anyone who, who isn't a, a regular follower of Arif, um, I don't know that he's quite at Michael Kist level, um, but he's <laughs> he's not necessarily the biggest fan of Josh Allen um, and ha- has been pretty open about that. And, you know, I, I think that I'm – going to look at the optimistic side of things in that Josh Allen obviously isn't at the point where he's an anticipatory thrower. He's not going to be a timing and rhythm guy. So if you're going to go out and get somebody, you either need somebody who can go out and moss somebody and just jump over top of them and get the ball and make it okay. Or you need someone whose footwork and route running is so good that he visually create separation to the point of beyond you know the nfl version of open where you have to rifle it in there and just barely make it fit he 
loses the DB to where you are wide open visually and can see the receiver be like, oh, wow, that guy's open. And then all of a sudden, Josh Allen's arm strength matters because he can fire it in there before the DB can react. And that all of a sudden now you're taking the areas where Allen does have some strength. He made some major gains in the intermediate game, you know, that 10 to 20 yard range where Diggs route running and then the timing that opens up in that area of the field really become a combination. Now, obviously, I hope that he works on and regains some of the accuracy, accuracy that we need on the deep ball and that Diggs has a great strength and that there are going to be, I, I think as you eloquently put it, Arif, some four-yard screens that go 15 yards over his head. Um, there's going to be a couple of those that we're going to have to figure out and work our way through. But I'm hoping that that ad and the domino effect that he has, and now all of a sudden John Brown is your wide receiver two, and going against number two corners, Cole Beasley is a very nice luxury as a three. Dawson Knox doesn't have any pressure as the seam buster on the, on the you know from a tight end standpoint. Just the way he pushes down the rest of the pecking order on the offense puts everybody else in a better space. So give us both sides of the coin of areas we need to be concerned on, you know, fans are asking, you know, how much was Diggs, how much was cousins, how much was Diggs overreacting, how much was the scheme and style of play being conservative and run based and not getting the ball out as often as a deeper receiver and a guy who believes in his skill set would want, you know, give us a little bit of the positive of what we can expect on the field. And then maybe some of the things we need to be concerned with. Sure. Well, I'll start with uh, with this olive branch about Josh Allen. I'll say he massively outperformed my expectations thus far, uh, which, which doesn't mean I think that he's necessarily good. I just had maybe expectations that were unfairly low. Uh, and, uh, and, and he has had to deal with a lot in terms of supporting cast. So I'll, I'll give him that. Um, and then the Bills are, are, are well on their way to kind of resolving that issue, as we've seen already. So uh, with regards to Stephon Diggs and his skill set, I would argue that Diggs, especially in his year with Keenum, uh, demonstrated uh, a, a set of skills that erase inaccuracy, um, which is uh, really helpful, right? So there's a couple of ways you can do that. So you know, Nate mentioned the kind of increasing the margin of error that you get when you increase your separation, right? Because if you're inaccurate on a receiver that has left the defensive back one yard behind – you've got a lot of room. So, uh, you know, the, the, the receiver can kind of make up that ground for you. So that's kind of one way he does it. He also does it uh, through really tremendous uh, deep ball tracking. I think that he does a really great job, especially, you know, I'm so used to having watched, you know, these deep ball receivers with a lot of speed, like, uh, you know, Mike Wallace and Charles Johnson and Cordero Patterson, who are not great at actually tracking the ball down. Uh, and kind of lose it in the lights or don't really know kind of where they need to set up and, and what their landmarks are and um, how they need to kind of adjust their body in order to get the ball. Now watching Thielen and Diggs, you know, they are really tremendous at that sort of thing. They also have really tremendous body control. Um, Diggs does a really great job, especially on sidelines, of turning these narrow windows into excellent opportunities. Um, if you fit a ball in pretty tight into a really awkward spot, Diggs just kind of finds a way to catch it. Uh, and so that kind of body control to make sure, you know, his, his feet are in, that he's balanced enough to, to kind of land where he wants to land. Um, that does a, a lot in terms of kind of erasing inaccuracy and stuff like that. Um, he does a really great uh, job stacking uh, defensive backs to make sure that they can't interfere with what is essentially exclusive real estate for him to get to the ball. Um, that's, I think, really important because, you know, one of the biggest issues with the deep ball is, you know, the likelihood of an interception because of how difficult it is to, to fit a window that gets smaller and smaller the further out you go. Uh, if you stack a defensive back, they, do, they just don't have the ability to get their arms to the ball, and he does a really great job of that. Um, he's a really, just a really great contested catch guy, especially at the catch point. Um, he does a great job framing. He does a really good job, uh, putting his body in the right spot in order to make sure that he can shield the ball once it arrives, you know, using his shoulder to cut off a hand, uh, and then also making sure that, that there's a clear target to aim towards. So, um, from that perspective, he does a really great job of erasing inaccuracy. And we saw a lot of that in, in 2017 with Case Keenum. 
Um, to, to add quickly there, I know I think a lot of Bills fans would be surprised for anyone who hasn't seen it. Even though Diggs is only six foot and change, one hundred and ninety five pounds, yeah, he actually led the NFL last year in contested catches. You'd think that'd be a a DK Metcalf or a Julio Jones or a Mike Evans. Um, so what you're talking about, not only does that skill set translate anecdotally in seeing it, but he actually led the NFL in that you know rate. You know, depending on what service you're looking at, right? Um, but I, I was really impressed to see that in the it wasn't just a nice to have every once in a while that he actually consistently did it statistically. Yeah. And it's, and it's, yeah, like you said, consistent three years running, he's been a top five contested catch rate receiver. Number one in 2017, I think number four, 2018, I think number one again, uh, no, number two in 2018 and number one again uh, in 2019, uh, all by pro football focus. So really good. Uh, I'm sure he's upset that Tyreek Hill beat him out in 2018. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, he's done a really great job uh, making sure that that the 50-50s are really 80-20s. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really remarkable skill set to have. And it does a lot, I think, especially for the kinds of quarterbacks like that Case Keenum and Josh Allen are where they're willing to take chances. Um, but you know, sometimes those chances come with, with, with inaccuracy. So you can do a lot there. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that he's kind of physically capable. Um, you know, he's pretty good in terms of agility and, and, and good in terms of speed. Uh, he's a three level route runner. So kind of whatever the defense shows, um, you can run whatever play you want. If there's a kill at the line, you need to run a different play. He can run that route. You can ask him to do anything. He does short, intermediate, deep. He does every route really, really well. Um, In terms of weaknesses, I think a lot of people expect him to be this really excellent after-the-catch receiver, and I think it's fair to expect that. Uh, He did a lot of that at Maryland. He played kind of a DJ Moore, uh, Percy Harvin role there, so he's like running the ball at times at Maryland. Mind you, he had a linebacker throwing to him, so sometimes he just (laughs) had to take over. Um, But, uh, you know, he's a good, but I wouldn't argue that he's like necessarily a great after catch guy. I think people kind of expect what you get from Golden Tate or Albert Wilson. I would rather send him on an intermediate or deep route and have him gain his yards that way, unless you're on like a, a third and 20 and the screen's kind of your best option. And he can, he can make that work. Um, I probably wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, he can get out physical, not at the catch point for some reason, when he, when he sees the ball, he gets stronger, but, uh, in routes, you know, he can kind of get bullied off of routes. If, if DBs get a hand on them and they can engage in kind of, uh, some legal hand checking. Um, I think the defensive backs are really great at hiding when they engage in physical in route contact are the ones that might give him the most trouble. Um, again, because it's like a modern NFL, it doesn't really seem to come up that often, but it is something to kind of pay attention to. If you've got kind of an keep to leap style defensive back that, that you're up against, you know, that's probably one of the few good matchups, um, that he'll have. Um, but ultimately, I mean, it's really difficult to define a set of weaknesses. I don't think that he's, um, as good as say Deandre Hopkins, right? I wouldn't call him a top three receiver, but if you ask me why it's actually really difficult because he's basically good at everything. Um, so, uh, you know, he's got great hands this last year. Um, he, uh, had some issues with fumbles and causing interceptions. Um, cousins threw five interceptions throwing in his direction. Two of them were directly Diggs's fault by, by, by clattering off of his hands. Uh, another one I think was his fault from a misread. That's really rare. Um, he does a really good job reading defenses, uh, and he's usually on page with his quarterback and he's got really great hands. I think he had zero drops the previous two years combined or something along those lines. So it it is pretty rare. And then the fumbles were just kind of wild. Um, so, uh, if you kind of adjust his like route running efficiency numbers for those turnovers, he goes from number, number two to Michael Thomas. So the second most productive receiver per route, uh, in the NFL, um, number two to about number 11, uh, because of those turnovers. But I think if you do it over the course of a couple of years and you, and you kind of ease out the problems that come with those turnovers, which again, I don't think are persistent, you know, he kind of rises up and he gets back into uh, the top 10 for sure. And maybe the top five, but he had a really efficient season. Um, so there's that. And then of course you mentioned kind of the, the off field stuff. I personally don't think it's that big a deal. Um, I, I, I see him kind of throw sideline tantrums every so often. Uh, and, and I think one probably pretty good example of how the team feels about it comes from an example that actually happened with Xavier Rhodes. When Xavier Rhodes was beaten by Marvin Jones in the end zone for a touchdown, um, Xavier Rhodes did something that Stephon Diggs kind of does. He, he got upset. He started yelling on the sideline, threw his helmet, 
And uh, Zimmer benched him immediately. And then right after the game, he went off on how, you know, Rhodes did this and you shouldn't do it and you can't do it. And that's just not what um, he allows. Diggs does it and he's in on like the next play. Uh, <laughs> like they, they kind of just don't care. And it's not because they're like scared of him. It's kind of difficult to imagine someone being scared of Diggs uh, if you're on his team. Um, it's, it's just because it's, he, he's not really very disruptive, right? He like stews in his own corner and then he like resolves himself, walks over to cousins and like makes a plan. Like it's kind of productive, honestly. Um, and so, uh, it, it, you, you ask uh, players about it after the game. You ask Mike Zimmer about it after the game and you're like, Hey, so Dick's kind of blew up on the sideline. You know, what was the team thinking? And, and they were like, Oh, he did. Huh. Interesting. Well, I didn't notice it. Uh, he just kind of does that. Don't worry about it. It's like, that's the kind of response that you tend to get. So I, it doesn't bother me that much. Um, I know that, uh, there are players that do feel a little bit differently, but most of the locker room doesn't, didn't seem to mind, uh, when that sort of thing happened. That said, he very clearly had issues with cousins. Um, that I think is more an issue of, and I think this fundamentally strikes at when and how Diggs has those tantrums, because very rarely is something happening where the team is winning and Diggs is upset. Very rarely. It's not like Mike Wallace who complained about his targets right after a game where they beat the Cleveland Browns, right? Like that's, that's like not a thing that occurs to Diggs. If they're winning, he's fine. If they're losing, he wants the ball because he wants to prove that he can carry the team out of, uh, out of that hole. And so there's maybe a line between competitiveness and toxicity that he kind of straddles and maybe he falls on the wrong side of. Um, but you know, that's, that's kind of big. And then when Diggs is winning his routes and honestly, he always thinks he is, but when he's like very clearly winning his routes, and I think the Chicago game in week four is a really good example of this where he's just like open downfield. Um, and it's against a very good Chicago defense. He's, he, you know, Diggs is like open downfield. He's throwing the hand up um, and he's not getting the ball. Um, if, if he doesn't, if if he thinks that cousins has time to throw to him and he doesn't throw to him, then he gets super upset. Um, so if he's open, he wants the ball. If they're losing, he wants the ball. That's kind of it. And, and remember the very same game, Adam Thielen also blew up and he's not a guy that people seem to think of as, uh, as a diva. And I think maybe a little bit of bias in play when it comes to that evaluation. I mean, Adam Thielen did swear at Bill Belichick. He has yelled at cousins uh, multiple times, but you go to the locker room and Adam Thielen is, is uh, just a wonderful person to talk to. So it's very easy to, um, to kind of gloss over some similar attitude tendencies they have. Also Thielen is the one that tends to calm digs down on the sideline. There's probably going to have to be someone on Buffalo that does that. But um, you know, you have to remember Thielen was incredibly frustrated too. And, and cousins, felt the need to apologize to Thielen. That's how frustrated Thielen was. So uh, I, I don't really see kind of Diggs' blowups as, as bad as they are, even if they are an issue. Um, so, yeah, they can be distracting, but he tries to find ways to make them not distracting. When he kind of gets over it, he gets back into kind of um, game mode, and he makes sure, you know, he walks over to Cousins, and he says, hey, I'm not asking you to force it to me. On this route, I saw this. Um, you know, I think we can make this adjustment here and you can put it on my hands, something like that. Right. So it ends up becoming productive, but it looks pretty explosive. That's interesting to be able to see it that way. And and I think it helps give some context to what is the biggest pending question. Cause you know, obviously Bill's fans see the stuff that gets on Twitter, the stuff that they talk about on sports center, they don't follow the team day to day. So we don't really know where that comes from. So Nate, when you hear that description in that, whether that's where your mind goes of who is that person to lean on in the wide receiver room versus where you see that kind of domino effect fitting in and I believe very strongly that Brandon Bean didn't give up four draft picks to not give this guy the ball and that we're not going to have some pecking order issue. I think that we're going to have manufactured touches. I think we're going to have a game plan that has him as the number one option. And I think that that's going to help not placate. We're not going to force the ball when it doesn't make sense. But he was brought in for a reason, and I think that they're going to be able to give him that love that, hey, you are going to be part of the centerpiece of this offense, 
in what's going to really make sense overall. And, and like I said, if it's a winning game where there's not a ton of catches, it's because you know Singletary had a big game, we're pulling away. But I think that he's going to be a big piece of that. Do you see that? And and how do you think they're going to be able to keep him one bought into the culture that they've already started to build, and then trying to make him fit in and feel like he is a big piece of this? Yeah, um, I think or, he. Arif, let let me have Nate uh, touch on that part. Oh, sorry, first. Yeah, yeah. no, you're good. Um. So my thought here is I, I kind of liked your point about uh, Cole Beasley, right? You mentioned Cole Beasley as maybe the the main beneficiary mm-hmm. of a move like this. And, and, I, and I think that's probably right. And I also think the other main beneficiary should be the deep ball with Josh Allen, um, but not in the way that you might think – Based on the addition of Stefan Diggs, you're thinking, OK, well, Nate's obviously talking about his ability, uh, Stefan Diggs ability to get the ball down the field and him high point the ball on deep shots. Right. I think less of that. And I think more of how can you possibly bracket coverage or, or bring a double team or a second safety over the top of John Brown when Stefan Diggs is on the other side of the field and, and vice versa. How can you focus your energy on a slot receiver um, when you have two guys on the outside? And then how can you, you know, even really if t- when you're talking about three receiver sets, which we know Brian Dable likes to run a lot of, well, now he's got three guys who all can separate, who can all run basically every route in the route tree. And two of which, I, I mean, I think John Brown in this particular instance is your go-to deep guy is going to see a ton more single coverage um this season so as much as those two are the beneficiaries obviously josh allen is but as much as this is a conversation about stefan Diggs, it's a conversation about josh allen right um and and how you manufacture touches for for Diggs is less important to me than how josh allen takes a step in those balls of 20 plus yards um because i i was pleasantly surprised with the improvement i saw in the short to intermediate uh throws this season um i think obviously cole beasley had a big big um reason for that that improvement in the intermediate areas and i think john brown did too um but where he and you mentioned the anticipatory throws greg and and i think that's also an area that i saw more from him last year than i probably did if you combined his rookie season <laughs> and all of his college film combined um i think you saw more it's, it's of that easy to just, go up from zero it, yeah, right. Exactly. Right. So uh, you're, you're, you're spot on about that. It's, it's, it was those deep balls and, and, and from my own experience playing the game and having a very similar issue when I was a kid um, is honing in how you throw a deep ball and not overthrow a guy by 20 yards. Like there were throws, Greg, and if I know, you know, this, like there were throws where, you know, John Brown is streaking on a post route up the middle of the field and, you know, Josh Allen overthrows him by 15 yards. Um, that isn't, Hey, you know, I need to, you know, put my shoulder up an extra degree and, and, you know, cock it, like it, that is to me less mechanical and that is a hundred percent mental. And once that hurdle, I think, I think in that second Patriots game where he hits John Brown, he hits, um, Dawson Knox, where you can see the velocity being taken off the football in a way and almost aimed a little bit more. I would, people say to quarterbacks don't aim it, but I'd love Josh Allen to aim it at a couple of deep balls. Cause it felt like at times that he was so eager to get the ball out and he's got the juice and we know he's got the arm. And I think he just wants every deep ball to be 55, 60 yards in the air and not every great walk away touchdown, 70 yard touchdown is 65 yards through the air. And understanding that and bringing that nuanced approach to a new season where I think a lot of Josh Allen's game is like, is like a three point shooter where if Josh Allen starts the game over three, over four, one of five, we know that that could be a game that gets away from Josh Allen. That's why some of the game plans early on in the season last year in preseason throughout the first couple of weeks, we saw a commitment to the passing game early on in games. And even in the preseason where we were almost like, why are they passing so much? But it was, for me, I think that's Brian Dable trying to understand a little bit of what makes his quarterback tick. Is he a guy that needs to be involved in the game plan early? Much like Diggs, I think you have a player in Allen and Diggs that both need to be a part of the game plan early to set themselves up for success for the rest of the game. That's a good problem to have if your quarterback mm-hmm. and wide receiver need to be on the same page to have a good game. Well, that's how you know that you'll you'll begin to manufacture without actually having to create game plans stemming around route concepts. Instead, you're just saying, hey, we're taking what the defense is giving us. But more importantly, it's that deep ball. I, I think that once you can you can sort of 
get the compression off what the defense wants to do to this Bills offense. All it takes is being somewhat competent in hitting that deep ball. That's going to allow a team like the Baltimore Ravens, like the Baltimore Ravens can't run cover zero blitz at you all day. If you keep beating them over the top. So, you know, that that's the thing is a lot of these looks that the bills got towards the end of the season was simply because the deep ball couldn't be thrown accurately. Once it did, I thought the bills had more success after that Patriots game. But again, a lot of this comes back to just Josh Allen, his development, but more so the development of that deep ball, because that is arguably the single most important development this Bills team has this offseason is hedging their bets that that Josh Allen can hone that in and not be nine of 68 or whatever he was on deep balls uh, on balls over 20 plus yards. Like that number has to be like, you know, I I could probably do nine of 68, Greg, and I (laughs) haven't thrown a football in quite some time, but like I really might be able to get nine of 68. Well, and I think it, it puts them in an interesting spot. And I, I had this debate with a couple other people that said, man, I, I don't know if I want to, you know, go and add I, this was I think they were talking about AJ Green at the time and like, yeah, that's going to put a ton of pressure that now he has to use that top guy. And I said, no, 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 that that's a, a terrible way to look at it in that it's not putting pressure, it's removing excuses. And that if that yeah, results in stress, it, it is what it is. I, I said, but we need to know what we have. Well, you know, after we get through this season, we're looking at the decision of the fifth year option for Josh Allen, which now in the new CBA is fully guaranteed. And that we need to know, hey, we've now given him every opportunity. I still wouldn't mind a little tweak on the offensive line, but when you're telling me that you just gave him Stefan Diggs, John Brown, Cole Beasley, probably a receiver out of this draft, Dawson Knox, a healthy Tyler Croft, you know, we're talking about you have everything you need to, to know we're going to know what we have and that he does need to take that material step forward from a deep ball standpoint. He needs to maintain and make the gains he he created in the intermediate game and, and how strong he got from 10 to 20 sustainable. And to keep that, he needs to show that, Hey, he is able to feather in a screen pass here and there. He is able to hit a swing route and not fire it into Frank Gore's chest immediately. Um, he needs to be able to show that he's making those gains and improvements. And now there are no excuses. There isn't going to be anything. Well, Hey, there wasn't a third weapon to be able to create separation. They were able to draw all the coverage towards John Brown. They were able to focus in on Cole Beasley on third and five. Well, now they can't do that. Now, now that you've removed every opportunity for that, they're going to be able to set up the offense that they want. And we're going to be able to make an informed decision. Hopefully, it's an easy one because he does make those steps forward. But if not, you've now removed any other excuse that you've had with some of these other guys where you weren't sure, hey, did they give whoever it might be? You know, there are questions on Mariota. There are questions on Trubisky. There are different questions. And some of these guys that, hey, you know, or did Bortles, did we give them enough weapons or is it because they weren't that good? And that, you know, if you eliminate that, now you know. Now you have an informed decision because you've given him every opportunity to succeed. And obviously every Bills fan is hoping that it's an easy slam dunk yes because he takes a material step forward. But if not, they know. And now they've answered that question very definitively that, hey, we're doing that. And they've built a fantastic roster. And I'm going to say arguably, you know, let's remove uh, Josh Allen completely. The Bills are now going to have the 52 arguably the deepest roster in the NFL, one of the best rosters in the NFL. And right there with anyone like the Chiefs, the Ravens, the 49ers, I think they're at worst in that top four from talent from 51 or 52 down to number one, the rest of those spots, they're giving themselves that opportunity for an informed decision to know that. So I'm curious to see where it goes beyond there. Uh, Arif, you you were chiming in on the idea of maybe where those dominoes are going to fall or how that's going to fit. Do you think that makes sense in the way that they're going to utilize that to, you know, again, I think giving up that much ammo for a player of this size, you are going to manufacture a little bit. And that when you grow up organically within the system with a guy like Phelan across from you in what is one of the few offenses that were even more run heavy than the Bills, I think that you have the opportunity to say, hey, we know you're really good, but come on, you kind of know where you fit in here, where you're going to get the ball when it makes sense, and you're going to have to be a good soldier the rest of the time. I think there's almost a little bit different dynamic psychologically that, hey, 
this is the guy we just gave up all that stuff for. We better make sure it goes well. Hey, there isn't an obvious guy parallel to him that I, I don't think John Brown's. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of John Brown. I don't think anybody puts him on par with Adam Thielen. I don't think there's any 1A, 1B. He is the wide receiver one. I almost think it's going to be easier to placate any ego that was there to be able to feed into a guy. Let's give him every benefit of the doubt that it's you know, competitive drive and him knowing, hey, I'm good enough to help the team here. When I light up this cornerback, I want the damn ball because I know I can help us. And, you know, being in that mindset, I almost think it's going to be a little bit better marriage to be able to help with that because of the position he's going to walk in day one. Is that logical? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that there was a a misconception among some Vikings fans, not too many, that that Diggs felt that he was overshadowed by Thielen or that he was kind of jealous of the attention that Thielen got. I think that's incorrect. They're actually incredibly good friends. It's kind of adorable, honestly, uh, how, how, how close they are. Smoke's um, very likable, so I think it should work great. Yeah, um, that's, that, that's really great, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and Diggs tends to get along really well with a lot of people uh, in the locker room and, and in the media. Um, so... Uh, that that I think is a misconception, but I think the way that you frame it is that there is a psychological difference with being the guy, right? Especially because there's another the guy aside from Adam Thielen, it's Dalvin Cook, right? Where you know he's going to run out the clock, and and the Vikings like like you said love to run the ball a lot, and he was kind of the centerpiece of that offense. You know, I don't think Devin Singletary uh, is is at that point, uh, and so when it comes to a skill position player kind of lifting the team or carrying the team on his back. I think that that puts it all on Diggs, and I think he kind of thrives with that. That's how he played his entire career at Maryland. Um, it's something that he's very used to, and it's something that he really enjoys. So I wouldn't say he disenjoys you know, playing with Thielen, but I think he really likes the kind of pressure that comes with it, and that might, I think, resolve some of those issues. What I find kind of interesting is that it's very easy for me to think, you know, hey, Diggs got pretty frustrated by Cousins, who's genuinely a pretty good quarterback, um, how is he going to be with Josh Allen, who I personally don't think is a particularly great quarterback? And when an accuracy issue shows up with Allen, it, it, he tends to miss by a lot when he does miss. Uh, and so it's like, it's got to be frustrating. But then I think about like when he was playing with Keenum, Keenum was not very accurate that year. I mean, he had some really remarkable rate statistics, but he was just not that accurate. And Diggs didn't seem to mind that much. I think he just wants chances. So um, I, I find it kind of interesting that this is kind of like another lens by which to kind of view uh, a player with that psychological makeup. Um, he's going to be the guy that drives the offense uh, so long as he stays healthy. That's been kind of another thing throughout his career. Uh, after he returns from injury, he tends to not be as effective uh, as as before injury. But part of that just might be because if you're throwing to Adam Thielen for eight games in a row and then, you know, the other guy comes back, you're probably still throwing to Adam Thielen. Um, and then vice versa, that happened when Adam Thielen came back when, when Diggs was kind of the sole receiver. So I don't know about that. That's kind of curious. Um, but yeah, I, I think that having that burden placed on him is something that he kind of lives for. And I think, I think he can work with like a really high level receiver working off of him. Um, I just think that when that happens, you, you probably have to win you have to pay back the promise of having a high level roster by winning. And then, you know, if he doesn't get chances, he gets upset. But if, if he's the guy and it it certainly seems like he will be the go to when it comes to digging the team out of tough situations. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great. Um, You know, he, he didn't get upset when they were running the ball, when they were ahead, he didn't get upset when Adam Thielen, you know, was able to, to grab the, the overtime touchdown. But if, if you think about it like this, if you think, like, hey, you know, Diggs has these kind of frustrations built up. If he's got the history of being the guy who grabs the overtime touchdown, if he's got the history of being the guy that makes the sideline catch that puts him in field goal range, if he can remember all those times the team counted on him, maybe those one or two times the team's not performing well doesn't get to him as much. And he just didn't have those opportunities in Minnesota because, you know, Dalvin Cook ran a 70-yard touchdown in, Adam Thielen grabbed a a 68-yard touchdown in overtime, and so he doesn't have the psychological background to know that the team is going to rely on him, even, even if they do. I think this is all postulating, but I think that that's kind of an interesting way to look at it because he hasn't been frustrated with level of play. I think he's been frustrated with the amount of trust he's been given. 
No, I think that that really makes sense in in the sense of it. Like you said, it's a it's not a selfish thing from purely you know outside of there. Like you used to hear that with Deshaun Jackson and, and getting targets in a win, and he'd be disappointed in it. And it you know it's like Carmelo that, Anthony. It's essentially yeah, the yeah, Carmelo yeah. Anthony. Yeah, yeah. That you just need your shots. It doesn't really matter how the team does. And being able to go down that path, I, I like that kind of idea to be able to see that I think it's a more logical marriage. And I think it's a little bit of peace of mind that I, I don't mind a little bit of diva. I, I want a guy who's talented enough that he has the chops to demand the ball. That's a good problem to have. And I don't know that we had that guy. And I think it came up in our playoff game in that they were desperate for that additional weapon Josh started to go a little bit too heavy to Duke Duke Williams, who wasn't ready for that spotlight. And then after the game, Cole Beasley handled it as professionally as possible, but said, you know, yeah, it'd be, hey, in a tough loss, I, I tried to do what I could with the opportunities I got. But of course, I wanted the ball more because I thought I could help the team. And I think that that helps if now all of a sudden the other guy that's getting those in that game, it was freaking 10 targets for Duke Williams in a playoff game. Yeah. If those 10 targets are Stefan Diggs, that's a lot more palatable for Cole Beasley and vice versa. That if we all of a sudden see that, hey, we're going up in a game and uh, whatever, we're playing the Rams and it's Jalen Ramsey, but Cole Beasley's putting their nickel guy in the blender, you know, Stefan Diggs is going to know that makes sense. That's okay. Like, hey, if I get Ramsey turned around, I want the ball on that play. But if Cole gets more, you know, targets that game, I think he's going to be on board as long as it's part of a win and not missing out on him when he has a chance to make the game winning play, that kind of stuff. I think that totally makes sense to be able to see that, that mindset. So Nate, one last thing before we flip over to some of the other bills stuff. Um, when you're talking about this kind of move, do you think this is that kind of chips to the middle, all in play in this window where you have the Josh Allen rookie contract before all the big extensions kick in, you know, is this what you were looking for coming into the off season as that sign that Bean believes we have something special here? Yeah, no doubt about it. I, and I'm excited about the, again, the volume of moves rather than, um, you know, going, putting the chips in on, um, you know, two players like the Jets did last year. And, and we're seeing some of the um, failures of the Jets um, sort of come back around in another off season um, to bite them. And, and I'm glad that the bills are in just completely different position right now than what the Jets are looking at, which, you know, is an ultra familiar position for bills fans um, being, in a situation where you feel like none of the free agents, not even the top tier, the second tier, but you were basically dealing with the third and fourth tier players on day one because no, you knew you weren't going to be able to get any of those guys to even consider Buffalo because they just weren't a team that was A, contending, or B, a location you wanted to be at. Yet they had neither um, of the two factors and in, in, in three, for the most part, they weren't unwilling to pay. So, I, you know, you look at the the Jordan Poyer numbers, you look at the Quentin Jefferson numbers, you look at, and then they overpaid a couple of guys in free agency, but, the, you know, some guys are just going to get overpaid. But the value that Brandon Bean continually gets, um, I felt in a pretty low place by like seven, no, maybe earlier than that. It would have been like 5 p.m. today. I was thinking to myself, man, this defensive line is the only thing I'm feeling real, <laughs> real shaky about. And then he goes out and gets two guys that I think from a value perspective, um, we'll see with Butler. I think that, you know, with, with Washington and McDermott and, and the pieces in place defensively for him, they know what they're getting in him. And I saw Joe Marino's tweet while, while we were on here, I always started the show mentioning that, that that's not a move. That's not a shot in the dark, um, a hope for to get a, a you know, a, a prospect that's raw, that's going to come in here who had one good season. Season, I think that they think they're going to put him in a position to have similar success that he had last year and try to avoid what we saw with the first three years, I think, of his uh, of, of his career. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I like the volume of the moves. Um, I, I like the names. I like the positions. Um, the, the thing that I'm most intrigued in uh, about is, is there another player – um, that we're not talking about offensively, whether that's on the offensive line um, or at a skilled position player. Um, I would be interested to see if they're going to potentially bring in another a tight end. Um, do they wait for the draft um, for receiver? You know, what they end up doing there will be interesting to see. But um, 
I, w- I would say I'm really pleasantly surprised on how they've done uh, so far. I mean, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not where you are yet that this is a top four, top five type roster. Um, I think we are, and this is kind of how I, I, I phrased it to Joe. And you know what, maybe, maybe I did in a way say they did have a top four, top five roster. I said that the bills are probably right at the top of that second tier of teams. Um, the green bays, um, Indianapolis is sneaky. I don't, I don't know if I love or if I hate the Phillip rivers move. I, I, I just, I simply, I don't know. It's such a weird, sexy, uh, it, okay. That move is a bolo tie, right? Like it is, it is remarkable. Have to be, yeah. uh, it is, it is, uh, there's turquoise, uh, there, there's just a lot going on. Um, and, and <laughs> that move in itself, uh, yeah, right, exactly. Uh, so yeah, like the AFC got better and, and the Ravens got better, but sort of the bills, it's just, it's a fun time to be in the second tier of the AFC. And I think that's behind, um, you know, obviously the Baltimore, Kansas city at this point. No, that's great. And, uh, you know, Arif, before we start nerding out on rotational defensive linemen that the Bills have signed, a- any other final thoughts from you that Bills fans should take away? What What's something they can look forward to with a guy like this and, and why they should be excited about this move? Uh, the highlight reel, man. He has got fun highlight. It's like, um, actually, Stevie Johnson's not a bad comparison. I, I, I said that last night. He's Stevie Johnson 2.0 with a little bit more juice. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I think he's a little bit more on time when it comes to route timing than, than, than Stevie Johnson, but, uh, Free baller. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in terms of like leaving defensive backs behind and having, you know, those one or two highlights where, uh, you know, their, their ankles have been broken and they're kind of in the dust, you know, five yards behind the ball. I, uh, yeah, I think, you know, Stevie Johnson did that. Uh, Stefan Diggs does that. It is, a ton of fun and he does it to everybody you know he's done it i think he did it to stefan uh gilmore so look forward to that um he, he's done it to uh really i mean he did it to pat pete uh he did it to richard sherman he did it to jair alexander i mean he's you know those guys will do a pretty good job against him overall in fact weirdly kyle fuller was the only one that had a complete game against him um but he'll have one or two plays where the defensive back looks like they've, they've been playing in high school. It's that's, I think the most fun. Hopefully that results in a completion. Right. But uh, I, that, you know, that happens one or two times a game against almost anybody. And it is fun to watch. And, and I think that's, you know, it's the kind of personality that he has. Um, he can be a fluid route runner. He chooses not to be, he just chooses to be an explosive one. Um, and, and it leads to those kinds of moments. So that's what I would look forward to. No, that's awesome. And obviously you're, you're welcome to, to hang on with us while we nerd out on a couple of rotational defensive linemen. But, um, as we're talking through there again, for, for anyone who has any chance, make sure you're checking out Arif's work, uh, over at the Athletic Minnesota, you know, really smart voice in the football world and somebody that I enjoyed being able to touch base with here at the Senior Bowl. Um, as we talked about a couple other moves that happened. So obviously last night you saw late night moves with AJ Klein coming over from New Orleans from a linebacker standpoint. Looks like the plug and play replacement for Lorenzo Alexander. He'll have some competition from a couple guys. Um, Mario Addison was a nice ad. Was one that I think from Nate, what you touched on, he was a little bit higher than I had hoped. But then you saw the numbers come out for what, you know, Robert Quinn got five years and 70 million. So maybe three years of 30 million isn't all that bad. Um, and that apparently is just the contract that's get, getting thrown around so mario addison the way i described it in our, our slack channel was i don't love giving somebody that age that contract but if you're going to do that the reason to do that is because you just hired his position coach and there's literally no one else on the planet who's going to be able to tell brandon bean hey this guy still has the juice left other than Eric Washington. He's going to know better than anyone else. So mm-hmm. if you're able to mitigate that risk a little bit, I don't love paying a 33 year old any money like that, but if you're going to get the sign off of the guy who was the closest to him and is now coming over and could have very tactfully and politely said, eh, that's a bit much. He might've lost a step. He's going to know if he's still got that there. And for him to sign off on that, I feel a little bit better about that number, even if it was higher than I hoped. Then tonight we go back and it was a pretty slow day. We did see um, uh, Tyler Matter. 
I, I believe it's Matikevich is, is how you pronounce it. Uh, he's a maniac who looks like a Game of Thrones extra from Pittsburgh, led the NFL in special teams tackles last year and uh, the most special teams tackles the last four years. You know, I think they're going to give him a token shot to compete with A.J. Klein for that strong side linebacker, but probably a depth guy and a special teams captain, that kind of role. And then tonight, like you said, we're you know talking about it. Hey, they made some other moves. The linebacker room looks pretty complete. You know, Stephon Diggs kind of makes it that now adding a, dra- a draft pick in the receiver room is a luxury. We're pretty those top three are pretty locked in. But man, that that defensive line room is a little thin. Shaq signed. I'm a little bit nervous. All of a sudden, now you come back to back. Quentin Jefferson is a really versatile defensive lineman, played a lot of rundown defensive end for the uh, Seahawks and then would kick into three tech on passing downs. Eric is a huge fan of him and did a ton of work showing how many different snaps he played at every single lineup spot. And then back to back with that Vernon Butler from Carolina, who I compared to Jordan Phillips. They're both six, four, 340 pound monsters who look like one tech, but play like three techs Mm -hmm. and having that kind of skill set all of a sudden, Whoa, now, you know, now Vincent Taylor all of a sudden is your fifth or sixth defensive tackle. And where does Trent Murphy fit in? And now we're having problems of who's the eighth and ninth and 10th defensive lineman, which leads to my comment. I, I queued up earlier in the show, all of a sudden, you have Brandon Bean's trade ammo to be able to recoup a couple of those picks you just gave Minnesota in the Stephon Diggs trade. So, you know, give me your reaction to some of the names that were out there, guys you were familiar with, guys that, you know, I, I can't lie, I didn't know a whole lot about Tyler Medikevich before that, uh, that, that move happened. But the rest of the guys were on the radar and people that we had kicked around. What were your initial thoughts on that setup and, and where those things came into play? Yeah, I wasn't super privy to... Um uh, Matikavich, as you uh, <laughs> beautifully put. Um, but yeah, you know, the subtle moves that I needed them to make, um, they weren't exactly the high profile names, um, the Linval Joseph, the Snacks Harrisons out there of the world that that maybe some of us had been um, allotting for and, and sort of standing for. But I, I think that, you know, you look at particularly Quentin Jefferson, you, you look at a player um, that at this point in his career, um, you know, I mean, he was a former fifth round pick, I believe, uh, he was picked up off waivers and basically outperformed a lot of the guys on his own defensive line that are going to be up for major paydays, uh, and most notably, uh, uh Jadavian Clowney, right. Um, mm-hmm. and Jaron Reed, another guy that's likely, uh, that he just re-signed, um, in, in Seattle. And, and I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of good, um, reviews for Jefferson amongst some of the Seattle media talking about they would have wanted to see him back instead of Jaron Reed, which, All the was, same one. Um, which was interesting to me. So, um, you know, I, they, they didn't add in terms of the sexiness or the names that let's say like Baltimore added uh, Michael Brockers and obviously Calais Campbell. Calais that, Campbell was yeah. a, that was a big trade, obviously. Um, but they paid but, 26 million for those two. Yeah, that's right. And, and the bills paid that collectively. Not um, even. For, I, you, yeah, right, not if even. you take Addison and Jefferson and Butler, the three of them together are 23 million versus the 26 million they paid for Campbell and Brockers. Yeah. So, and, and, and you look at that and yeah, those are names and that's some girth. Like they, they've sure. got some serious girth. Oh, that, that that was, it was a good, line. good ad. I like the Bills' versatility across the line. Yeah, you mentioned Trent Murphy as the odd man out. I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, guarantee that. No, no. Um, I, you know, I, 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 th- I think there's a scenario where knowing that you've got three defensive ends, thirty plus, um, that keeping Trent Murphy around with your cap flexibility might, may not be a bad idea. No. Um, maybe, but I think you know. Then you wonder what are you going to do with. Um, with Daryl Johnson and and is that gonna, that a guy you want to continue to keep around for developmental purposes? Real quick on on it. that point, I think it gives him the flexibility to wait to cut down day. I, I think that yeah. you can go through there and all of all of a sudden, hey, we're at September first and Jerry Hughes and Mario Addison are both healthy, looking good, and hey, we stumbled into Josh Uche at pick fifty four, or we got Bradley and I fell to pick eighty six. And Daryl Johnson's looking pretty good. And we know Quentin Jefferson can go back and forth. Now, all of a sudden, you can make a football decision. Mm -hmm. And it happens to have an $8 million bonus attached to it. But you're not doing it purely to to get the money back. 
Yeah, and and again, th- these are all moves that 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 Brandon Bean. It's sort of like uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, where Larry David starts the episode by setting up the joke that he's going to finish at the end of the show. Yeah, and Brandon Bean is signing people and signing players for what you think is a particular need or a particular hole with the flexibility and the back end of being able to get out of that contract. I mean, essentially the two defensive linemen they signed today are essentially one year deals um, for the most part um, that you can get out of Jordan Poyers, essentially a two year deal that you can get out of after three years. They essentially give him a year and his cap hit at six and a half million. It just, it's, it's, magic and you know for anybody that's in 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 the chat or watching or listening or that will listen that's a Sabres fan I know that this this strikes particularly um deep for you because you know with the particular general manager for the for the Sabres um was was supposed to be touted and was touted as this you know salary cap genius when um I think Brandon Bean is proving move after move trade after trade um that his understanding of value is his single greatest asset um and understanding how to manipulate the cap in a way to do exact do the exact opposite that Les Need and the LA Rams have done um to build uh, maybe not a roster that's as top heavy but holy cow way deeper and way uh, I think way better built to play games in in January um, and into February where a top heavy roster we know um, can be good one year and down the next, all it takes is one or two injuries. And the bills have built a roster for a roster that can sustain injuries at just about every position. Um, I'd like to see them add another offensive lineman. Yeah. No, I think that's yeah. a good call. I'm going to come back to that here in a moment. I, I had called it earlier in the, the Slack channel and on Twitter that I think Brandon Bean's final masterpiece, you know, piece de resistance move, he's going to trade Trent Murphy and it's going to blow everyone's mind that he's going to get trade compensation back for Trent Murphy. And I can't wait to see everyone's reaction to it. Hey, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. If you think it's going to happen, I'll, I'll, I'll hop on your bandwagon. The, uh, the details came out while we were on the show here live. And thank you to Ron in the chat, uh, copied him in there. The full details for Jordan Poyer's deal now came out. Um, it, did add on the additional years. It basically takes his existing final year, that cheap deal that they brought him in on, adds it on to the final two years that were the two year, 20.5 million. It makes it a three year, $22.7 million deal. They did it again. Bean is a genius. He did a $3 million signing bonus and a $4 million roster bonus that hits in the seventh day of 2020, which means on March 25th, which is simply a week later, he gets another $4 million. So all of a sudden it's, hey, we really appreciate everything you're doing for us here, Jordan. We're going to give you $7 million up front, but we can afford to eat an extra four of it this year. And all of a sudden we can add a little bit more to that cap number, more than we would have to be able to take care of it. And then all of a sudden you're not kicking a ton down the road. You're only adding six point two seven five million next year with a one million dollar signing bonus he's only going to have a seven million dollar cap hit next year and then 17th among safeties yeah and that, heck, that's 17th like that? right yeah. now you yeah. know how right. many other extensions right. and contracts are going to be signed between now and next march he could be it's 22nd 23rd 24th yep. you know and then the year after that he's going to be 6.6 million and and it's just having that kind of cap flexibility is so smart when these big extensions are kicking in. I do think that we see both Dawkins and Milano. I, I, I'm going to assume after the draft, he had talked about them taking place after he can focus on it, but heck Jordan Poyer happened today. So I, I won't put anything past him. Um, I like the idea of being able to take those moves, take advantage of the cap that's out there. And I was playing around. We, we talked about it in the chat. I think that our best case scenario is that, Maybe there's 15 million more realistically with the cushion he likes to keep. There's probably eight to 10 million left. In my mind, that's one of those lower tier running backs for two to three million. That's maybe a mm-hmm. shot in the dark on a corner at two or three million. Maybe that's a Greg Van Roten for five or six million. What are some names you'd like to see that, you know, although he's already added a very nice bevy of talent, we, we've filled a lot of holes already. Where are the spots that you could still see a little bit of shopping left? So I'd like to maybe even stay local, stay close to home. I wouldn't mind them maybe restocking on Lager and Waddell on another one year deal. Sure. Um, Kevin and, Johnson. Yeah, he, yeah, Kevin Johnson. Um, the same thing. If if they don't um, go and find a corner, I, I'm a little 
jealous, a little upset that uh, Desmond Trufant became available. I don't think a lot of, I don't think it was necessarily known he'd become available. Yeah. Um, he, to me, he's the guy or Chris Harris is another player like corner um, offensive line. Those are two obvious positions. I'd like them to, to maybe consider adding another piece to those are a little on the, on the larger side. I don't think at this point, um, Chris Harris is, is kind of in, in the, uh, in the realm. It could be, I would be surprised if it was um, having said that. Yeah. The running back position is another one I'm really looking at. Um, Devonta Freeman's an interesting name for me. I know the, the injury history is there. Um, I, I would be interested to see him with Devin Singletary. They're both small, um, powerful backs. Then you have TJ Yeldon as your third back who can catch the ball out of the backfield. Um, I, I'd be interested in that. In that. Well, so, and a um, nice note on him, a lot of fans, and I, I've been poking the bear. I, I was you know, totally against the contract that Melvin Gordon was looking at before, but all of a sudden when Austin Eckler signed for four years, $24 million, I was like, huh. If that's the number for Melvin Gordon, I I might be on board. The yeah. one difference is Devontae Freeman already got his monster payday. Mm-hmm. He already got his forty million dollar deal with twenty right. some million guaranteed. Melvin Gordon's never gotten that. So the odds of one of them taking a the lesser deal, surprisingly lower than market deal, it's mm-hmm. a lot more likely that Devontae Freeman's the one that's going to take that. So I actually like that name a lot, and I think it's one Bills fan should listen for. Yeah, I I would be all about it just from a, a kind of an offsetting skill set yeah. standpoint. Um, he's more of a physical runner, but again, it's that availability. If he's you know going to play five games for you, then I'm not interested. But you, it's not something exactly you can you can predict. So I don't know. I mean, if he's going to go someplace where he's got the best chance to stay healthy, it, it seems like the Bills are doing some interesting things here to keep Magic. guys healthy. I, so, I, yeah. I don't know if I understand Wizardry. all of it. Wizardry, yeah. But so I, I think that you touched on a couple others. I don't think we're still in the market for Chris Harris. I think especially yeah. seeing what Trey Waynes got from Cincinnati, I think that took us out of the Chris Harris market. But I think Mackenzie Alexander is a name that is in yeah. that Kevin Johnson tier that, you know, was a first round pick, didn't quite live up to it. If you can snag him for that same Kevin Johnson where it was a two million dollar deal that he could make up to three million, I'd sign on for that. Yeah. I, heck, I'd offer to give it back to Kevin Johnson if he doesn't find the market he's looking for. Um, I also threw out there besides Devontae Freeman and Melvin Gordon are the shinier names. Um, I wouldn't hate Carlos Hyde for two million. I wouldn't hate Peyton Barber for two million. I think those are kind of thumpers that could take some wear and tear of carries. That's if that you I, strike out and you let the, you, that. That's a uh, that's a May signing. I, you I know, agree. Like, I agree. You know, and that I think that that's one where you're talking. Hey. Maybe you bring that in and then you pair it with a rookie that has a little bit more juice and all of a sudden the thumper is the guy who pushes TJ Yeldon off the roster. It's one of those kind of things, but those are names in that ballpark. Um, I think Greg Van Roten is a lineman who's going to get more than later in Waddle. So if we do there, that might cost us six, seven, eight million. Sounds like the ballpark. But I wouldn't hate it if we just brought back later in Waddle, give him he had a two million dollar deal last yeah. year. I give him that same deal again. I'd give him I'm, the I'm same okay deal. I'd run it back. Yeah, I'd run yeah. it back. And and you know the uh, I think it was Ron in the chat just mentioning like um, you know I mean yeah Chris Harris could totally be back on the table if you cut Trent Murphy though uh, like you, eh, you bring you you insert eight million back into the cap then maybe Chris Harris is available. I I I don't want to let myself get excited, but the idea of you know on base defense yeah. it's Chris Harris and Trey Trey White and then all of a sudden on nickel he kicks into yeah, the nickel Norman back and then josh norman or levi wallace or whatever that competition comes in at that spot oh good lord now with the rotation of eight now heck we have 11 nfl caliber defensive linemen today but whatever eight make the roster and you're able to just constantly rotate them through and you have that back seven coverage oh good lord it's it's that's the stuff yeah. of dreams. So it, when you know, maybe not literally the two thousand Ravens, but when you're talking about the Trent Dilfer path earlier, that's the <laughs> that's way you, you go about it. doing that. that that's, that's the way you, you go about it. doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've been going for a while here. A lot of good stuff uh, for any fans who are worried that uh, Brandon Bean was going to have a boring um, off season and not be able to add any talent. Uh, he's certainly shown that he takes his job seriously. You know, we're now talking about our fifth and sixth, you know, free agent, huge trade for Stefan Diggs. Uh, Get ready to tweak all of your mock drafts that are out there. The Bills are now still going to have seven picks that, you know, I think people feel like, oh, we gave away the farm. It's, you know, he still has a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, two sixths. 
and a seventh. We're still walking away with seven mm-hmm. picks from this draft. And again, I'm, I'm calling my moonshot here. He's going to trade Trent Murphy for something that matters as well. So um, I, I think that it's something where we still have a lot of things to be excited about. A- any final notes? Obviously, you know, the people can see you uh, on your fantastic show on WGR. You're always uh, active on Twitter. You're, you've been a, a, an amazing guest uh, for a myriad of shows around the Bills Mafia circles for podcasts. Uh, anything else you have coming up or final uh, party notes for Bills Mafia? Yeah, I'm going to put some, you know, of my scramble thoughts onto some, uh, onto a Word document and get it out at WGR550.com at some point this week. Um, after everything kind of settles down um, and dust settles and I can kind of give a, a nice 30,000 foot view of, uh, of, of sort of what the start of the offseason looks like and into the draft. Um, but yeah, you know, it's um, at, at this point of the year, it's uh, my, my brain's in a hundred directions and, and it's a very unique circumstances that we're under currently. So a lot of time um, to do this kind of stuff. I'm happy to do it. So absolutely i appreciate it man and the same way i've ended the last couple shows you know you guys are coming here to be able to get away from the realities of the world i know it's scary out there this is not a a political show this is not a show to debate on what was an overreaction or underreaction but i will take a moment to just beg each of you be considerate think of each other thinking of each other can mean checking in on a loved one it can mean checking in on a relative it can mean checking in on an older neighbor do it smart do it careful wash your hands be careful listen to the guidance that's out there um nobody knows how long this is going to last whether it's a couple weeks or a couple months or stretching on for a year we have no idea let's all hope that everything goes as well as possible and we get through this together but we're going to have to get through it together so um just think of each other be careful be considerate take care of each other you've been listening to cover one buffalo and we are out